I'll be reading from Job chapter 2. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, From roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without any reason. Skin for skin, Satan replied. A man will give all he has for his life. But now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. Then the Lord said to Satan, Very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. His wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, You are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all of this, Job did not sin in what he had said. When Job's three, three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Namathite, heard all about the troubles that had come upon him, they set out from their homes and met together by agreement to go and sympathize with him and comfort him. When they saw him from a distance, they could hardly recognize him. They began to weep aloud, and they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads. Then they sat on the ground with him for seven days and seven nights. No one said a word to him because they saw how great his suffering was. So the, for the last uh, couple of weeks, we've been talking about optical illusions. And, um, and uh, you know, it's that things aren't quite what they appear to be. And so, Jennifer, you, you're going to have to go ahead there a little bit. You, yeah, keep going. <laughs> There's a video here. I want you to watch a video here uh, about some. <laughs> All right, go to the next. There we go. Watch this for a second. Or a little bit here. <laughs> 10 mind-blowing optical illusions. Flat third dimension. Nothing appears abnormal about this Rubik's Cube until you realize it is a two-dimensional image. This illusion is created with a distorted perspective of an image that requires to be viewed at a specific vantage point to create the 3D effect. This is the same method used in the very popular 3D sidewalk art. The Ames Room. The Ames Room illusion creates a cartoonish and very intriguing effect of drastic size differences between people and objects. By tricking your depth perception with an irregular shaped room, the walls, ceiling, and floor align in a way that will appear normal at just the right angle. This causes everything else in the room to appear to warp in size. Following eyes. Here is a simple but very effective illusion that makes it look like these little guys are watching you. This is done by manipulating the way you see perspective and the brain's natural ability to pick out faces and patterns. The head is actually concave, and this sets up a contradiction in your brain to make it look like it's turning to follow you. The dress. Whether you see black and blue or white and gold, this dress has caused debate and confusion. Though the dress is indeed black and blue, it has become a popular example of color constancy. Depending on individual perception, as well as current room lighting, the dress can be seen as either black and blue or white and gold. Circle illusion. It is easy to assume that these dots are moving in a circular pattern. However, they are not. Each dot is traveling in a straight line while on its own path from one end of the circle to the other. By adding each dot one by one, you can see the illusion come into place. <laughs> Motion illusions. These images are not animated, but they appear to be moving due to the cognitive effects of interacting color contrasts and shape positioning. If you're feeling skeptical, pause this video and watch as these images continue to wave, twist, and pulse. Animation Illusion This clever and old-timey technique creates a multiple frame animation on a single sheet of paper. By manipulating the mind and eye, 
These still images come to life using a simple graded card. Drop-off room. This 3D painted room is enough to trigger one's acrophobia as it seems to be a massive drop-off. This painting was created by Master of Optical Illusions, Regina Silviera, whose work often contains a larger-than-life bent reality. Yes, no. Artist Marcus Reitz specializes in optical illusions with his mind-manipulating 3D creations. A prime example of his work is this sculpture of the word yes that can be read from one angle, but moved to another angle and it morphs into the word no. Backwards chair. This chair appears as normal as a chair can be at first glance, but just wait until this man has a seat. It might feel surreal at first. Okay. Optical illusions. You know, things aren't quite what they appear. I thought those were pretty amazing when I saw those and, you know, especially those little alligators looking at you. That just really, I went, wow, that's crazy. But, you know, they weren't what they appeared, was it? You know, it appeared to be one thing, but it wasn't that. And sometimes, you know, we look at things and we see things a certain way. And that even comes with ideas, um, with uh, wisdom. Sometimes we see things and we think it's one way when it really isn't. And so today we're looking at something many people think is, uh, but it's not what it appears, all right? The common wisdom is that if bad things happen to me, then God must be angry with me and is punishing me. And that's an optical illusion in a sense. It's an illusion. It's not the truth. It seems like that makes sense, all right? Because God is a just God. And so when he's mad at me, he's going to bring me justice and, and do something to me. But if I'm a good person, then everything's going to be all right. And so we get really confused when we don't think we've done anything wrong. And then all of a sudden something bad happens to us. And we wonder, what did I do? And so that's what people think. But tell that to Job. All right. Tracy Ellen read that passage about Job there in the second passage. And, and what we didn't read was the first chapter where he lost all his children. He lost all his livestock. He lost almost everything that he had. All that was precious to him. <laughs> I'm not even going to say what they say about his wife. But anyhow. Um, but all this stuff. And then Satan comes back and says, well, you know, God says, hey, what do you think about my, my servant Job? You know, and he says, well, you wouldn't let me touch him. You wouldn't let me do anything to him. And of course, he's going to be good to you. But you let me make him uh, unwell. You let me make him suffer a little bit personally. And you're going to see a difference. And so God says, okay, he lets him. And, you know, we have a hard time understanding why God would do that. You know, why is God doing it? It's one of those parts of the Bible that we can't comprehend sometimes. And we think, man, God, are you really loving to let him go through all of that? But Job, Job had a good point towards the end of, that, of the second chapter there where he says this. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? You know, the song we sang earlier, Blessed Be Your Name, that's what that song's about. You know, the, you give and take away. And um, it talks about, you know, good and the bad. And we have to take both. And, and I still choose to say, Blessed Be Your Name, you know. You know, later Job gets so down, though, due to the pain from his illness, that he questions God. And if you read through the book, you see that his friends come, those fr friends that we saw there, all those Ike boys, um, shoe, shoe height, and I don't know whatever else they are, but they came and sat there with him just quietly for seven days. And that was good. You know, sometimes we need to come along people and just kind of be there with them in their, in their misery. But then they opened their mouths. <laughs> and basically what they told him was, hey, you've done something bad. You've done something wrong. You need to repent. You need to confess. You need to, to figure out what you did and make it right with God. You know, and he says, I didn't do anything. And so Job gets so down that he, he questions God about why this is happening. And God then basically says that his ways are greater than ours. He says, hey, you, you know where the moon goes. You know where the sun goes. I mean, a lot of things like that. And, and he, so he says that basically he's God and that we can't understand the complexity of God's mind. 
In Romans chapter 11, verse 34, it says this. Who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? And so we can't always comprehend why God is allowing us to go through things. And even if he told us, we may not be able to understand it. But what we're going to do today is try to understand it a little bit. All right. Try to understand it. Kind of look at some of the reasons why we have problems and why we struggle. Why God lets us go through these things. And so the first one, of course, is this. Because of our own action and behaviors. When we're struggling, sometimes it's our fault. Newton's third law of motion states this. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. And for us humans, it could be said that our actions have other actions. All right? They have consequences. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. Like, for example, if you're late every day for work, you're probably going to get fired. That's not God's fault. God didn't make that happen to you. You didn't do what you needed to do. All right? Now, let's say you go to work every day and you're on time and you do your work well. Guess what? You might get a promotion. Again, that's because you did the right thing. But, you know, if you're texting on your phone in traffic and you run into the car in front of you, that's not God's fault. God's not punishing you. That's because you weren't doing the right thing. If you don't study for a test, you might fail. If you call someone a name, you might get punched in the nose. If you eat too much, you may feel uncomfortable for a while, you know. Proverbs 14, 12 says, there is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. And so what it's telling us is that there are consequences for our actions. We may think this is right. We may think this is what we want to do, but there are consequences if we do the wrong, if we make the wrong choices. You know, um, one of the things I see sometimes my uh, children say to their kids, you're making bad choices. And they are when they were told that. And that's what happens with us. And sometimes we suffer. Sometimes we have problems. Sometimes life isn't good for us because we make bad choices. And so that's why. But then sometimes we have problems and we struggle. And this is a hard one for us. And that is because stuff happens. Sometimes stuff just happens. You know, and um, in Matthew 5, 45, it says he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And if we kind of want to look at that as as good and bad, we kind of see that. Now, I'm not sure that's necessarily what he's talking about. But but the thing is, is that good things happen to bad people. Matter of fact, sometimes it seems like good things happen to bad people a lot. I mean, there's a lot of people out there who aren't very good people and they got a lot of money, which tells me maybe having a lot of money isn't really that important. All right. It's not really necessarily a blessing. But he also, bad things happen to good people. And we see that quite often, you know. And uh, I've seen uh, good people really struggle. People who love the Lord, people who are godly people. And of course, they still mess up. But then things just happen to their, in their life just because it does. You know, good people, Christian people get cancer. And good people, Christian people have financial problems. Not because of anything they've done, just because life. And sometimes... Good people, Christian people, have marital problems. Sometimes not because of what they've done, but maybe because of what their partner's done. But stuff happens sometimes. And so we understand that, that sometimes we have problems for that reason. Because stuff happens, and it does. Good stuff happens too. But sometimes bad stuff just happens. You know, you, you live somewhere and a tornado comes and your house is destroyed. 
You didn't do anything. It just, it happens. And that's kind of what's going on here because God, He can stop that stuff. He can stop all these things we talked about. Even when we are texting and we run into the car in front of us, He could stop that if He wants to. But He doesn't. He sometimes just allows life to go on. And sometimes we get in the way of life. Or life gets in the way of us. And so sometimes stuff just happens. But when we are going through problems, when there are things that are happening in our life, we do need to check something. And we need to see if there is something that we need to change in our life. Because in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7, it says this, Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? Okay. Now, what is discipline? Discipline is to correct behavior, to bring you, help you to do the right behavior. And so I think sometimes God can do that. Right? If there's stuff in your life that you need to change, number one, you may have consequences. And that's why God won't take those away from you because you need to be disciplined. Maybe sometimes he also brings other things into your life just to catch your attention. To make you pay attention to what's going on. Not that he wants to punish you. Not like he wants to you know, punch you in the head or something like that. But he does it because he wants you to come back to him. He wants you to live life, that full life that he always meant for you to have. So maybe... We're just being disciplined. And so maybe we need to look and see, is there something I need to do? And so when it says, you know, when I said earlier that, you know, if bad things happening, I'm being punished. Not necessarily punished, but maybe disciplined. Being tried to be put back in the right path again. Because you strayed off just a little bit and you just need to be guided. Do you ever uh, remember in the uh, 23rd Psalm where it says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me? You know what a rod is? It's a stick. All right. Why do they comfort you? Why do they comfort him? Because it helps to keep you in the right place. That's what the shepherd used that for. To one, to protect in case something comes at you to hit it, but also to keep you guided, to keep you where you need to be. And um, that's what God does with us. And so sometimes those things, those hardships, those things that are going on might be to catch our attention, you know, so that we know um, that we are doing the right thing. And we'll see that. But then there's another reason too. And that is so that we might persevere. Our verse that we read earlier today in James chapter 1 verses 2 and 3. I'll read it again here. It says this. Consider it pure joy my brothers and sisters. Whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. You know, if life were just always good, if everything just went well all the time, a couple things would happen. Number one, we get lazy, wouldn't we? Life's good. I can just sit back and relax and not worry about anything. And we kind of forget about God. Okay. But when we have struggles, it makes us stronger. It makes us tougher. You know that old saying, if it, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger? And there's truth to that. There's a lot of truth to that. And God wants his people to be strong. Because he knows in this world we're going to have troubles. Didn't Jesus say that? He said, in this world you are going to have troubles. He said, but be mature for I have overcome the world. And so we're going to have troubles and he wants us to be ready for those. You know, we don't know what's coming up. We don't know what's going to happen. And so sometimes the little struggles, the everyday annoyances, things that just bother us. Do you ever just get totally frustrated, you know, some days? Just because nothing seems to go right. And for me, it's usually Sunday morning. You know, that's what, <laughs> you know, the computer doesn't want to, it wants to update when I don't want it to update. You know, this happens, you know, the com copier doesn't want to work, whatever. These things happen. 
And, um, you know, we get frustrated. But it teaches us, perseverance also teaches us what? Patience. If you ever pray for patience, know that God will give you opportunities to be patient. <laughs> All right. So just be aware of that. Just be aware of that. But he wants us to persevere. He wants us to be strong no matter what comes our way. And so he says to consider it pure joy. Isn't that a strange saying? To count it pure joy. Woohoo! I'm having these troubles. I don't think that's what he means. He doesn't necessarily mean, you know, call everybody and have a party because, you know, you, you lost your car. You know, <laughs> that's not what he's saying. But what he's saying is be strong and know where your strength comes from. Because your strength comes from where? It comes from God. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And so we have that strength that only God can give us. And so when we persevere, it's showing our faith in God. When we consider joy, because God is testing us and knows that we are strong enough. You know, it's, God never tests us. He never tests us where we're weak. He always tests us where we're strong. Now, Satan, on the other hand, he tempts us where we're weak. He knows our weaknesses and he, he pokes that and pokes at that, trying to get us to fall, to fail. But God tests us where we're strong. Why did he ask Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac? Because he knew that Abraham was faithful and he would be obedient and he would trust God. Even though this was his only son, the one that God had promised him, he trusted him and he persevered. So we do the same thing. See, we might have a hard time understanding why God would allow us to go through hard times, but God has his reasons. Sometimes it's because of our choices. Sometimes because he just let the world do its thing. Sometimes to teach us and sometimes to make us stronger. But we must realize that no matter what we have to go through, he's always there. Psalm 23 again, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. You know, no matter what we go through, God is always with us. Jesus said, and I will be with you until the very end of the age. We're never alone. We're never by ourselves. We're never going through anything, no trial, no problem, no tribulation, except God is with us. He's always there to give us the strength. You've heard this story before, but I think it fits so well. Horatio Gates Spafford was born in New York on the 20th of October, 1828. But it was in Chicago that he became well known for his clear Christian testimony. He and his wife, Anna, were active in their church and their home was always open to visitors. They counted the world-famous evangelist Dwight L. Moody among their friends, and they were blessed with five children and considerable wealth. Horatio was a lawyer, and he owned a great deal of property in his home city. Not unlike Job in the Old Testament of the Bible, tragedy came in great measure to his happy home. When four years old, their son Horatio Jr. died suddenly of scarlet fever. Then, only a year later, in October of 1871, a massive fire swept through downtown Chicago devastating the city, including many properties that were owned by Horatio. That day, almost 300 people lost their lives and around 100,000 were made homeless. And despite their substantial financial losses, the Spaffords sought to demonstrate the love of Christ by assisting those who were grief-stricken and in great need. But two years later, in 1873, Spafford decided his family should take a holiday in England. And knowing that his friend, the evangelist uh, D.L. Moody, would be preaching there in the autumn. And so Horatio was delayed because of business, so he sent his family ahead. And his wife and his four remaining children, all daughters, 11-year-old Anna, 9-year-old Margaret Lee, 5-year-old Elizabeth, and 2-year-old Tanetta. On the 22nd of November, 1873, while crossing the Atlantic on the steamship Villa de Havre, their vessel was struck by an iron sailing ship. 226 people lost their lives as the Villa du Havre sank within only 12 minutes. All four of Horatio Spafford's daughters perished, 
But remarkably, Anna Spafford survived the tragedy. Those rescued, including Anna, who was found unconscious, floating on a plank of wood, subsequently arrived in Cardiff, South Wales. Upon arrival there, Anna immediately sent a telegram to her husband, which included the words, Saved Alone. Receiving Anna's message, he set off at once to be re reunited with his wife. One particular day during the voyage, the captain summoned him to the bridge of the vessel. Pointing to his charts, he explained that they were then passing over the very spot where the Villa du Havre had sunk and where his daughters had died. It is said that Spafford returned to his cabin and wrote the hymn, It is well with my soul, right there and then. The first line of which is, when peace like a river attendeth my way. If anyone knows what it's like to suffer, to have problems, not because of anything that he had done, but yet still trust the Lord and know that God is good and blessed be his name, it'd be Horatio Spafford. So we need to learn from him. We need to learn from Job and know that if we're going to take the good, there's going to be some bad come along as well. So we need to trust God in spite of that and know that he is good all the time. All the time, God is good. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for being with us today. And Father, I know that sometimes we go through life and there are and it goes real smooth. Everything's good. But then, Father, all of a sudden the bumps come. And sometimes they're, they're gigantic bumps. They're mountains, Father. And we don't know how we're going to get over them. And yet, Father, we do. Because you are with us. And, Father, may we just learn from those, those things. May we gain strength. May we be taught what you want us to know. But no matter what, Father, may we realize that you are always good and that you love us very much and you want the best for us. You want to give us a life that is full. And so help us to understand that, Father, in the midst of these problems. And may we be like Horatio. May we be able to say, in the midst of tragedy, it is well with my soul. So, Father, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And uh, I'm sure you know what song we're going to sing. <laughs> so let's stand and we're going to sing it as well. We're going to sing the first and second verses of this song. And if you've got a decision to make, if you need to know Jesus, if, if you've got a struggle right now you're going through and need someone to pray with you, we got people who are willing. So let's let's sing. <laughs>